All right, welcome everyone. Delighted to have you with us today. Uh, my name is Katie Cannon. I'm the Curator of Education at the DAR Museum. And uh, we are delighted to welcome you to, um, um, uh, to our first lecture series of the, uh, of the year, of 2021. So we offer these lectures for free on the second Tuesday of every month. Usually, occasionally we have to adjust for a holiday or something. Uh, but uh, please do check our website, www.dar.org for the schedule. Uh, next month's lecture will be on the topic of hearth cooking with redware or earthenware. We also do offer a variety of free online resources for students and adults. So I hope you will check it out. Uh, so we, um, for this lecture, you, uh, for those of us who are joining us uh, live via Zoom, you will be able to ask questions. You can take a moment to find the, the Q&A box probably along the bottom of your screen. At any point, you can uh, type something into that, uh, into that box and it'll pop up on, um, on the presenter's screen. Now, um, she is going to be saving all questions for the end of the, uh, of the lecture. Um, so don't, don't worry, they're, they're, they're coming through, we're getting them. Um, she's just going to be, uh, to be getting to those at the end. But the nice thing is that you can enter them in at any point that you think of the question. Um, you don't have to try to remember it until the very end. So today's speaker is our very own museum director. Heidi campbell Schof is the director and chief curator of the DAR Museum. And that's a position she has held since 2013. A veteran museum professional, she's worked in cultural, uh, curatorial and administrative capacities over the past 23 years. Her research interests include women's history, 19th century social history and material culture, and the intersections of anthropology and social history. So welcome, Heidi. Thanks, Katie. I am very happy to be here today and uh, to give this little uh, talk that I've developed. So um, a little introduction to the talk. Uh, this presentation was developed for a docent training um, program <clears throat> that uh, several years ago uh, to illustrate how objects can tell many different stories that can lead us down a number of roads of discovery. I was uh, trying to think of an object that appeared insignificant upon first inspection um, and would seem to offer few options for expanded interpretation, something not owned or made by an historically significant person, um, something that is not particularly unique um, in form or function, um, and that the majority of people could identify without any special knowledge. Uh, believe it or not, there are quite a few of those uh, types of items uh, around, but I decided to choose the straight pin since uh, its small size, I believed, also contributed to its seeming insignificance in the grand scheme of, of history. So uh, let me share my screen with you and we'll get started. Okay, so <clears throat> today I'm gonna to talk about interpretive techniques, not talk about interpretive techniques or schemes, but how this mundane object uh, represents a long continu continuum of human history, touching on cultural traditions, technological advancements, and even socioeconomic history or theory. This four line children's rhyme dates to actually before the mid 1600s. English diarist and general bon vivant Samuel Pepys wrote in 1667, this day I've heard Coventry post to the king his ordering of some particular thing in the wardrobe, which, of, which was of no great value, but yet as much as it was, it was a profit to the king and saving to his purse. The king answered to it <clears throat> with great indifferency as a thing that it was no great matter whether it was done or no. Sir William Coventry answered, 
I see your majesty do not remember the old English proverb, he that will not stoop for a pen will never be worth a pound. Pins are so ubiquitous that to keep this lecture within our bounds, we'll be taking some leaps through time. Suffice to say that at any point where we land today, there are paths to follow for more investigation. Some of it has been done while others are waiting for the right researchers to come along. Pins have been around <clears throat> ever since humans have wanted to attach two pliable things together. To secure a fur around one's shoulders, for example, or to hold a hair in a knot on one's head. The earliest pins were made of pin-shaped things like thorns and fish bones, uh, slivers of wood, <clears throat> um, slivers of wood, these um, particular pins I'm showing today are uh, <clears throat> date to the Neolithic period. Um, these particular pins in this picture are from uh, found uh, archaeologically in Georgia about 10,000 years ago. As you can see, they feature some decoration, though uh, some bone and wood pins are simply plain from this period. There is still uh, a lot to understand about why these particular pins are decorated um, and some are not. And the meaning, if, of, if there is any, of this decoration, it may just be um, a form of making something a little bit more attractive. This Roman pin that we see here, um, of course, We've uh, jumped um, quite a few uh, centuries uh, into the future. Uh, does not have a date particularly uh, associated with its record. So I'm not really sure um, if this is a, a Roman pin from ancient Rome or it could be a Roman pin from earlier um, in, the, in the period. By the time um, of the Bronze Age, uh, pins, um, typically or obviously perhaps started to be made out of bronze and this particular pin is uh, made from uh, bronze. Um, of course, bone and, and wood and other materials were still used as well. Um, this, uh, I picked this picture because it also shows this transition to having a head on a pin. And I wanted to show that um, in a tech, to, as I speak, um, you might want to know that tech, tech, a technical term, I guess you could say, this is the head of the pin, this is the shaft of the pin, and of course, this is the point of the pin. And you can see in this pin that it has a, a sort of a triangular or, or pyramid-shaped or cone-shaped head, um, but the shaft is kind of a... Uh, uh, beveled very much like the pins that you see here where the shaft is, is beveled as well. So um, I see this as sort of a transition be, um, between the not having a head and having a head. The variety of pins available in the ancient world was vast. They could be plain like this one or have decorative heads uh, shaped like animals or people or other objects uh, or have precious stones attached to the head. They came in various sizes depending on their intended use. Uh, today I'm primarily focusing on Western culture, but pins appear uh, to be present in many of the major cultures of the world from China, Japan, India, uh, both Sub-Saharan and Northern Africa, and of course the, the Americas as we saw in the earlier slide. Pins are both tools and decoration. Uh, throughout their history, um, they uh, functioned as both. Um, around the Middle Ages, they seem to diverge into distinct categories. Uh, one of adornment, um, and they, these pins start looking more and more um, like jewelry, and one for as function, um, and those are used as fasteners um, alone. Uh, for the rest of this talk, 
I'm going to be focusing on the latter, the, the, the more, I guess, mundane or um, practical use of the pin as a fastener. You probably, if you think about pins, uh, straight pins specifically, you consider the sewing room to be their habitat. Uh, the seamstresses or tailor's tool. Historically, however, they were more commonly used in the wardrobe by all people, but most particularly women and children. There are accounts of men where using pins to uh, fast, straight pins, as we're discussing here today, to fasten things. Um, Together, uh, some uh, men of the poor um, parts of society who could not afford buttons to close their sleeves or, or um, other garments were using straight pins as well. But as a practice, uh, most straight pin fastenings were being used by women and children uh, primarily. Pins in the study of dress are intertwined um, since they were indispensable for, for fastening garments um, for hundreds if not thousands of years. So let's take a look at how these pins were used in that way. Um, this uh, portrait of a woman in a uh, winged hood or gauze, very light um, gauze um, hood dates to the, uh, the 1440s. And um, I'm using portraiture Basically, because it's is visual, um, but it it has some pretty obvious limitations. Um, a, an artist needs to in, decide that they are going to put the pin um, as in place as a visible item in the in the painting. Um, they could choose not to as well. So I've tried to uh, find paintings that um, show us the pins. I also uh, recognize that portraiture by and large is the domain of upper class people. And so um, I have also endeavored to try and include um, images of people from other classes when I can uh, find them in an art so that we can look at how they were used um, by those people as well. Um, Starting in the 1300s, metal pins start to appear more frequently and in greater numbers. One way they were used is to fasten veils like we see here in this woman, uh, but also uh, fasten gowns. In 1348, Princess Joan of England, King Edward III's daughter, uh, was preparing for her wedding and she included 12,000 pins in her trousseau. In 1440, Ships docking at Southampton, England, carried 83,000 pins from Flanders for the, the English market. And you can see here uh, a straight pin with its round head um, holding her veil or hood here, and also a small pin right here um, holding it around her, her neck. In this image, um, where we've jumped to the 1600s in um, the Netherlands in this Dutch painting. She uh, shows a servant at work. And um, if you take a look uh, closely here at her bodice, I, I believe, and it's, I of course not seen this picture in person to see this much clearer, but um, this appears to be uh, perhaps brown brass um, headed pins holding the, the front of her bodice together. Jumping across the, the pond, so to speak, we see this print, um, a well-known um, colonial print of Jersey, of uh, entitled Jersey Nanny. In fact, this is Ann Arnold, an enslaved African-American woman in colonial Boston. Uh, you see straight pins holding her kerchief around her neck and also keeping her bed gown. This is the garment that she's wearing. It's a, um, it's not something that she, that you wore to bed. It was a, a term at the time for a loose fitting garment that um, sort of wrapped around your body. And she uses a straight pin here to hold it closed. 
also in America, a few decades later, um, shows um, this uh, woman at the very height of society um, and wealth wearing a stomacher, which you see here. This is a separate part of, of her, her dress, her gown. Um, this is the um, end of the bodice of the gown. And then this, this portion here is called a stomacher and it can be changed and uh, changed in and out um, as desired. And um, this is being held in place by invisible um, to our eye, straight pins, a stomacher and like, uh, appears without the dress, like this um, example from the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And you can see these tabs, some stomachers had tabs, some did not. These tabs um, helped facilitate the, the attachment of the, this stomacher to the, um, to the support garment underneath, which is called uh, stays. This artist who painted Sarah ben Benedict's portrait decided to paint in the straight pin um, that um, I'm zooming in here. You can see right here, holding her handkerchief um, around the, her shoulders. Um, the fact that she's also wearing um, gold beads shows us that she's uh, not um, She's not destitute by any means. Um, she's not poor. Um, she just chooses to wear a more uh, plain um, uh, style of dress at this time. By the time photography comes around in 1839, pin use for fastening clothing had fallen off dramatically, uh, mainly because uh, hooks and eyes uh, have become the preferred fastener. So most women and most um, um, women's clothing are being uh, closed by hooks and eyes. But uh, sometimes you can still find pins if you look closely. Um, at this image of a woman around 1848, you, uh, you see that she, in fact, is holding her uh, little shawl around her neck uh, with a pin here, but she also has pins um, stuck into her sleeve here. And one, and I don't know why, um, she has up here on her upper arm. Um, perhaps she was sewing and she put these here for storage and didn't think of it, or perhaps she wants to tell us something that has been lost to to time um, with the significance of these pins. Reference to pins also show up in literature. Um, Lord Byron, um, the author of the well-known um, epic poem, Don Juan, writes here, pricking her fingers with those cursed pins, which surely were invented for our sins, making a woman like a porcupine, not rashly to be touched. So um, as you know, this, the long story of um, the Don Juan and his seduction of women, this is something that um, is being described that even in the early 19th century, there were still more pins than he would like to have um, in uh, women's clothing. So as I said earlier, um, children also acquired pins hold in place. Uh, and this continued beyond when um, women started using more hooks and eyes to hold their clothing in place. Uh, so uh, pins were still associated with um, children for well into the 19th century. Um, this little songbook by John Marchant um, of uh, songs for both girls. There was a section for girls and a section for boys and a section for children, children in general. But in this section for girls, you see the song, uh, Miss and Her Pins. These pins, sharp and bright, so trim, neat and white, that this paper so prettily border, some here, some there, 
in my cap or in my hair, I range in most delicate order. By help of the pen, I make myself fine and set off my dress with an air. I see by my glass, it looks with a grace and my clothes in olden fashion appear. My knot and my hood, it sticks to the mode. My kerchief, it holds in its places. The kerchief or kerchief, it fit, fixes my ruffles and other pantuffles in their plates, it keeps on my laces. If then the small pin so trifling seen so be obedient is when I will it, I most plainly it shows my duty to those by whom I am clothed and filled. Um, 18th century uh, poetry doesn't quite um, rhyme when we use it um, or pronounce the words in the in the modern sense, but you get the idea. Most children's clothes mimicked adult clothing for much of history with infants and young children of both sexes wearing dresses that often echoed women's styles and thus used straight pins. And this um, portrait of a little girl, um, we don't see, again, um, the artist doesn't show us the straight pin, but the apron here that she is wearing is called a pinner apron and would have had pins securing it here to the front of her bodice, whoops. Um, also the front of her dress was um, probably uh, pinned together in the, in the front as well. Swaddling is a practice that is thousands of years old um, and also required pins. Um, the image that you see here of a nurse holding a swaddled child, this, all of this wrapping here, um, some of it required pins to hold in place. Uh, other items of children's wear or infant wear that was required, um, including the um, swaddling bands. Um, this example is quite early that went around um, the child, but underneath those swaddling bands included uh, the diaper or clout um, and a pelch or the, the cover over the diaper. Um, those items were also used uh, or held in place with pins. Um, pilch, P-I-L-C-H, is another, it, what we would call, um, well, was replaced by uh, the rubber pants over the cloth diaper, if you uh, recall. Um, cloth diapers. So um, with the need for pins for, for babies and, and children, um, it does is not too far to understand that um, gifts for young mothers in, could include a pincushion like the one you see here. These pincushions often would have uh, inscriptions or little uh, um, sayings on them, often saying uh, something relating to welcome little stranger, um, since at that time we didn't, people didn't know if a child was going to be a boy or a girl. And um, there was a lot of uh, belief as well that children, um, parents could wait to see how a children, what their um, uh, temperament is like, um, and wait until you know well after birth to to give them a name. So welcome, little stranger, is a, a suitable um, inscription for a little pincushion. These pincushions are fairly small, um, oh around um, maybe three by five inches um, square. Some of them are square, some of them are rectangles. Um, I see most of them um, in these shapes and not um, round. Uh, all of these little dots that you see here are heads of pins placed into what usually is silk, um, pincushion that is filled with bran. And, um, and as, as you can see, these pincushions also are two-sided. And um, this particular one in our collection shows the, the date um, as well. So uh, these pins, obviously would come in handy to a new mother, but uh, some were saved, such as this one and others that appear in museum collections. Um, 
perhaps the mother didn't uh, need the pins that much. Maybe she had her own supply and this is was, could be saved as a keepsake. So pins, it can be truly said that pins were part of people's lives from cradle to grave. Pins held in place bur burial shrouds as evidenced by archeological finds at uh, grave sites and pins also held in place the veils and crepe worn by the mourners. While mourning was uh, practiced in earlier eras, it wasn't until um, the death of Queen Victoria's husband, Albert in 1861, that um, true um, level of Victorian mourning really took off. Um, but the, the general practice of mourning in the Victorian era required that uh, people wear, and most of these people would be women, since that um, duty was placed on middle class, middle class and upper class women um, much more heavily than it was for men. Um, that they wear all black, uh, that they um, wear crepe, that they wear, um, that they stay away from wearing anything of color or white or um, of a shiny metal like gold or silver. So um, in comes the morning pin and these pins were made, as you can see on the top example, matte headed, so they're not shiny, but they're also black, so they disappear um, under the crepe and the lace that were uh, worn at this time of, of mourning. So another use uh, for pins, so we're gonna move away from uh, the dress and, and garments. Another use uh, was, for pins was as fasteners. And these are fastening uh, papers together. Uh, the top example on the left-hand side, you can see a pin that is holding this typewritten document, which indicates that this is something from likely the early 20th century. Um, the, um, the paper clips here uh, are shown as an example of a later uh, method of fastening papers together. But for most of history, papers that needed to be held together uh, in a temporary fashion, um, the pin was the main form of, of, of doing that. And this one is, is from a, uh, I believe it's from the 1600s sermons of a minister in England where, that he used to make these tiny booklets of his sermons that he could carry with him and, um, and put in uh, these pins to hold them together temporarily. Um, the, uh, just so that you know, the, the stapler and the, the paper clip that you see here these, those two inventions didn't come along until the very end of the 19th century. And so well into the 20th century, we're seeing pins still holding papers together. Um, so uh, it, is, it is something that I think today we don't really think about that much um, when we see pins holding things together and we wonder why don't they use a paper clip because most of the, for most of history, we didn't have those. Um, but also, um, in an archival sense, these pins, and this is a good example of what happens, um, pins uh, often that were used to hold papers together weren't the brass pins uh, that were available, but the more, less expensive iron pins. And they, when, once their protective coating has worn off or degraded, they will rust. And um, archivists don't want to have rust in the, in the collections for the preservation of papers. So those pins and of course the paper clips, but the, what we're talking about pins are removed. And um, an interesting collection at the Bodleian um, about that. The Bodling uh, 
Bodleian um, Library in England, and we'll sh I'll show you that later, um, um, shows you what happens to some of those pins. But another example of pins as fasteners shows up here in um, the textile records, textile token records from the Foundling Hospital in the, um, from the 18th century. The um, London Foundling Hospital was established to take care of children whose parents couldn't care for them, um, usually because of financial destitution. Um, intake records like the one we see here, the partial, partial one we see here, um, pre that are preserved in books and have bits of fabric um, attached to them with straight pins. These uh, are called tokens um, in their, um, and are used to help identify the child in the event that the mother is able to come back and claim the children. And I know this one is a little bit difficult to see uh, because of the pattern of the fabric, um, but you can see as I zoom in, here's the pin right here, holding the piece of fabric to the intake record. And um, just uh, if you were wondering, that out of the 16,282 children taken in by the Foundling Hospital between the years 1741 and 1760, only 152 were reclaimed. So here are the Bodleian, um, the, here is the Bodleian collection of uh, dated pins. Um, in the 19th century, um, some librarians decided to um, as they were processing the historic records that they had in their collection, they started, decided to remove the pins and put them in papers and date those um, <clears throat> pins from based on the papers from which they were taking them. Um, here is one of those papers and you can see uh, the different pins that were found in documents. These are out of marriage bonds that were being processed and the, the librarian is showing the different dates. Now, when I look at this, I have to ask as well, is when was the pin actually placed in the document? Because it could be placed in the document much later than when the document was, was created. Uh, so is this a, a foolproof way to date pins? Not necessarily but it's a way to see the, um, a sort of a, a, a pattern over time, um, comparing uh, different uh, pins from a larger uh, group like this, you'd be able to um, kind of narrow down what, um, what date or how old the pin might be. Um, you can also see how uh, by this example that some pins and Throughout history, this was the case that some pins are different, made in different sizes um, for different purposes. Um, some were long, some were short, some had much thicker um, shafts than others. Um, but uh, again, most of them, as you can see, have these round tops on the on on the or heads. So let's let's go to talking about making. Um, pins. So pin making, this is an image from um, Diderot's encyclopedia. It's an 18th century encyclopedia created by um, a Frenchman who um, included a great number of images of people uh, working and industries and their tools. And it's a, it's a great resource. Um, this one shows pin making and some of the tools. Uh, there are other um, images of, of pin making, but this gives you a, a better idea. Um, this dates, this image dates from 1762, so you get an idea of it's in the mid 18th century. And, um, and it shows how the pin making was carried out in France. Each pin, each individual pin was made by hand. Um, they were then 
once the pin was, was constructed or created, they were put into a paper by hand to keep them organized. Here is a, a close-up image of that engraving, top of the engraving. Uh, one of the main um, things necessary to make pins is to draw wire. And that's what you're seeing here and over here. Um, wire obviously is, or perhaps maybe not as obvious, but wire is the primary um, ingredient um, component of a pin. You have the wire that makes the shaft and the point, um, and then the head is created by um, wrapping another piece of wire around on itself, usually about three times. And then the, the wire is the, the wire shaft is pushed down through this round circle of, um, or ball of, of wire. And um, it is annealed as well to, to give it strength. So as I've only covered a handful of steps in the process, but you, you get the idea that, that pin making had a lot of um, different steps to go through. And at the time, in the 18th century, all of those steps were done by one person. And then um, it's not until later in the 18th century that it actually has become, becomes much more um, organized. Here are pictures of pins in paper that appeared not to have ever been taken away from those that paper. Excuse me. And you can see the round tops of the pins. So um, pin making became um, very of, of great interest to a scholar named Adam Smith. And those of us who have maybe read a little bit of um, economic history or perhaps just know a little bit about economics, The Wealth of Nations is one of those classic um, tomes that uh, many economists uh, read and still look back to today. And this image, this is an image of Adam Smith here. And in 1776, he wrote in the inquiry into the nature and causes of the wealth of nations. And he is an enlightenment thinker and he was trying to find uh, how uh, discover how you know, some nations are wealthier than others and why is that? Um, why could that be? And this is, as you can see, this one is a two volume, um, this is an image of the cover sheet where the, this, the title page of volume two. So it, it is a multi-volume um, treatise on, on this idea. But for our purposes, he takes a look at the pin manufacturing and um, he describes the different steps in pin, man, pin <clears throat> excuse me, pin manufacturing. And um, he, uh, excuse me, lost my place there. He um, describes the 18 different steps that, that went to, into making a pin and discussed that the fact that most of these pins most of these steps are taken by one person in a pin manufacturer. So one person is going from um, beginning to end on one pin and doing it in that way, a person could make about 20 pins a day. Um, he argued that if you distributed labor and you assigned one person, one of those 18 tasks, and that person did that task over and over again, that you could create, you can make more pins and in fact, you can, uh, he estimated make 4,800 pins a day. So this concept became the foundation of the industrial revolution. Um, the pin industry um, was primarily centered in continental Europe, but by 1662, the government of Great Britain prohibited the importation of pins to discourage the, the, to encourage the domestic pin industry. So, so it's been about, you know, it was about a hundred years into this pin industry 
that Adam Smith is looking at. And, um, the, and if we look at the pin making in the colonies, uh, they started much slower um, in part because of the restrictions on industry in, placed upon them by England um, as um, they are colonies and they did not want to have um, pins, uh, pin, a pin industry and competing with their own um, pin industry. Um, during the American Revolution, of course, this changes um, a bit, uh, but basically embargoes on supplies coming from that pins are um, becoming harder to come by. Um, Abigail Adams writes in 1775 to her husband, John, who was in London at the time, it is that you would send out Mr. Bass and purchase me a bundle of pins and put in your trunk for me. The cry for pins is so great that what we used to buy for six, seven shillings, six pence are now 20 shillings and not to be had for that. A bundle contains 6,000 for which I used to give a dollar. But if you can procure them for 50 shillings or three pounds, I pray, let me have them. So handmade pins, because of the observations of Adam Smith and also because of innovations being made by um, entrepreneurs and inventors at the time, um, they're will soon become a thing of the past. Uh, when in the 1820s in England, um, an inventor created a machine for pin making that basically raised up a head is what, and this is what you're seeing here, a raised head. And these are the kinds of heads on pins that we are used to seeing today. Um, instead of uh, having a separate um, ball of, wire attached to the top of the pin. Um, there's just, uh, the wire is pushed up at the top to create the head. And of course, obviously this would take uh, fewer steps than to make the pin. Um, this, in addition to some other innovations meant that production um, in, grew in England to 170 pins a minute by 1840. Um, in the United States, pin making made slow progress after the American Revolution. Um, most of the experimentation was happening in the New England states. Um, but um, finally, uh, John Howe established his pin manufacturer in 1836. Um, and he establishes it with a mechanized production, um, the US can now, could now then become a competitor in the pin industry. And this is not a terrific picture of a paper of pins um, because of the pattern that you see on the front. You can see this is house uh, pins. And, but you see, you can see these little dashes here. These are the, the bits of the pins that you can see coming through the other side of the paper. Still, um, this is the uh, one of the patent models for the uh, pin making, one of the pin, pin making machines that Howe came up with um, in the 1840s uh, to uh, continue to improve upon uh, the pin making in, in the United States. Still, English pin making would grow um, in the last half of the 19th century, uh, producing 100 million pins a day, um, greatly outstripping their competitors. Um, of course, the plentiful supply, as we understand economics, would mean that the prices for pins went down. But that, in addition to the far-reaching um, nature of England's empire, meant that English pins were primarily the pin that you were going to find all over the world when talking about straight pins. And um, they are uh, going to maintain that world domination, so to speak, in the pin industry until 1939. Um, and 
by 1939, England has about a dozen uh, pin manufacturers and after the war, um, pin manufacturing doesn't come back as strongly. And um, today there are no pin manufacturers in England. There are still some pin manufacturers in the United States, but most pin manufacturing are, uh, is being done now in Asia. Um, I wanna say the short list for uh, uses of pins that I've covered today is incomplete by far. Pins have been used in a number of ways for medical, religious, and um, even occult practices um, throughout history. Excuse me, my cat wants to make an appearance. Sorry about that. Um, but uh, those are all uh, valid um, discussions, but for another different le lecture. Um, but I would like to close my talk today for another quote from our friend uh, Samuel Pepys. Um, in August of 1667, he writes, um, I walked towards Whitehall, but being wearied, turned into St. Dustin's Church, where I heard an able sermon of a minister of the place and stood by a pretty modest maid, whom I did labor to take by the hand and the body, but she would not and got further and further from me. And at last I could perceive her to take pins out of her pocket to prick me if I should touch her again, which seeing I did forbear and I was glad I did spy her design. So you can see uh, one more use of pins is in um, self-preservation and self-defense. Thank you, Samuel Pepys. So I hope you can see after this lecture that looking at an everyday object like a pin provides us with so many interesting avenues of investigation. Um, I've only touched on a few of these topics. Um, any one of them could still be expanded to better uh, understand our human past, but I hope this is a, 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 a place for um, further investigation and uh, for some of you out there. So I thank you for um, listening to my talk today. And I'm gonna take a look at the um, questions that um, you have uh, submitted. Let me take a look here. Let's see. Um, so I see that there was a, a couple of comments about pins, and I think I've addressed some of them. Um, so pins, yes, pins were imported. Uh, most pins in um, the early years that I talked about in the Middle Ages and up until the 18th century, they were imported to um, England. Um, most of the pins were being made on the continent um, until the English manufacturing in the 18th century takes off. Um, so yes, they were um, made, um, you could say they were made locally if you were local to the pin manufactory, but um, this, it was a manufactory and they were um, imported um, imported uh, for that purpose. Let's see. Let's see, we have some comments and some questions. There are accounts of actually wearing or living with garments that were full of straight pins, yes. Um, yeah, I imagine they would sp uh, poke people. I, I think that pins, use the use of pins um, in the past, I think is a um, uh, something that we can experiment with here in the future. We're not used to living with them. So I think they had the, um, the a more skill at placing the pins and inserting the pins in a, such a way that they, they didn't slip out too, too much or too often um, and that they didn't poke, poke the child perhaps or the person that they were putting the pins into. Uh, we don't do that as much, but uh, today, so, um, that I think that is one of those things that you can investigate um, as, as a form of um, experimental archaeology. 
Um, let's see. Someone asked if they were wondering if the item of clothing called a pinafore got its name for the use of pins to secure it. Good question. I don't know the entomology of the the, the word pinafore. It, it, it could possibly be that, um, in fact. I don't know. Um, some of these questions I've answered in the later part of the, the lecture are paper clips and staples, modified pins. No, they're, they're actually their own thing. They were invented as a, um, a perhaps a solution to using pins, something um, that were more effective or, or uh, more accessible to um, use in the office. Uh, the first staples, uh, the first stapler only put the staple in. It didn't fold the two ends, so you still had to fold the two ends. And this was around 1879, 79, 80. So it isn't until the 1890s that there was an actual stapler. Like we would use it, so you would put the paper in and staple, and the, the two ends of the staple would be folded in on themselves. Um, so someone also asked, they, the, some of the bodily pins appear spiral cut like a screw. Um, the shaft is, is straight, the top of the pin is a spiral. Um, so yeah, it, the, I think what you're seeing may be some evidence of the corrosion um, when uh, they were in pieces of paper. How do you recommend storing modern pins to keep them from rusting? Well, uh, the, <laughs> the obvious uh, point is to keep them from getting uh, damp or in humid areas. Um, the, uh, if you're keeping pins to use for later, keep them in a pin cushion, um, pin cushion with bran, uh, pin cushion with emery in it uh, helps to remove some surface rust and to keep them sharp. So that's another um, option, but um, it's always, uh, as a museum person, prevention is the point um, and, and of, of what I do, uh, prevention of harm. So if you can keep them from getting damp um, or held in a humid place, uh, that's the best, the best thing. Um, let's see. Here's someone else who has, um, quoted another, an old Irish song that and includes pins um, as a, uh, a way of showing, uh, uh, giving someone a paper of pins um, as a way of showing their um, affection. Queen Elizabeth wouldn't have worn a stomacher because, well, Queen Elizabeth, I'm sorry, not, not this current Queen Elizabeth. Yes, she did wear a stomacher and um, she uh, had many of them because she was the queen. Um, but yes, it would have been um, placed on her stays with pins. And um, she, there's also, I remember reading and I'm not gonna quote the number, but she also had a, great quantity of pins as part of her um, everyday supply of, of dressing implements. There was a guild that was in charge of pin making. Like most of the early trades, uh, there was a pinner's guild, which um, would mean it would limit the access to the knowledge of pin making to only members of the guild and apprentices. Um, that meant that um, the guild would um, protect this um, knowledge and keep it for themselves. Um, when, and this is, there's a whole discussion about this um, and how the pin making got pulled out of the guild and um, placed into more of an, a manufactory and uh, mechanized because uh, that uh, from my understanding is basically when the guild left um, uh, the area near London, um, which was, uh, what's it, um, I'm trying to remember the place. Let's see if I wrote it down. Um, 
but the, um, the guild left London and the manufacturing left London, I should say. Manufacturing was pushed from the area around London to uh, Birmingham in the 19th century. But um, it was over the course of the late 18th century into the early 19th century that that happened. Um, where, what is the name of the pin collection pulled from the items being archived? That is the Bodleian Libra Library in, in England. Uh, it's spelled B-O-D-L-E-I-A-N. Uh, library. And um, if you Google it, you, you will see a little bit about it. The one article that I read um, previously for this presentation is no longer up. So um, it was a blog post by one of the um, keepers of the, the special collections there. But um, mm -hmm. So let's see. Um, What's the best method of removing a rusted pin from cloth fabric? That's a good, uh, that's a good question. I, I, I'm not gonna answer that because I'm not a conservator and I don't know what kind of fabric you are talking about or how bad the rusted pin um, is. If it's not easily removed, you may wanna consult a professional conservator about that. Um, Let's see, I will kind of scan down through and some of these questions came in before I got to some of the um, some of the information that was in my in my uh, talk. So because uh, it looks like we have uh, quite a few questions to answer. Um, and um, let's see. I believe that the how is John Howe of pin manufacturing the same Howe of Howes and Stevens dies. I believe so. He was involved in a lot of different uh, concerns relating to, say, te the textile industry. I believe it's the same. I know it's the same um, for, uh, there are, yeah, I, I believe it is the same. Uh, let's see. I've not done any research on hat pins. Um, a question. Um, one thing I could say though, that straight pins were used uh, to keep the women's uh, caps uh, on their heads in the 18th century um, and earlier when they wore the white um, caps that you see in um, illustrations um, to keep them in place. Um, a straight pin, um, usually right at the top of the head and uh, coming through uh, the hair that's been pulled back, will keep the, the, the cap in place. Which metals were used for pins and how did that change over time? Well, there are, depending on what the pin was, was intended to be used for, uh, dictated the metal somewhat. Um, brass by and large was a popular pin uh, material for a very long time because it didn't corrode as easily as iron. As I mentioned before, iron was another um, material. It was less expensive than uh, brass. Um, there are silver pins as well. Um, there are bronze pins, but by and large brass. Um, interestingly, um, there is a, and if you want to follow her, I think it's a fun um, a uh, person to follow on social media is um, London Mudlark. Um, mudlarking in the River Thames is a hobby for those uh, in and around London uh, because it's a tidal um, river. It um, goes, the when the tide is out, it uncovers things from, from as far as back as ancient um, history up until recent, um, history and you find she finds a lot of pins that um, have washed into the Thames, made their way into the Thames over over the centuries. So um, those pins pr primarily are uh, brass. They could have um, higher um, copper content as well to um, not um, rust and, and, and corrode um, away as, as uh, an iron pin would be. 
um, what were pin cushions stuffed with? Most of the time, pin cushions were stuffed with uh, bran, and that is um, just like the bran that you might buy off of the the, the um, grocery shelves. Um, that was something that that was light but could be compacted solid, so uh, the pin would hold. Um, other pin cushions were stuffed with wool. Wool had the advantage of having lanolin in it, and the oils would help um, keep uh, pins from rusting. Um, and then, of course, you would have an emery uh, pin cushion to sharpen and and clean clean your pins as well. That's true. Um, Sandra Spinelli says, uh, yes, common pin is the same um, term as a straight pin. You'll see in historic uh, records and um, diaries or um, um, store accounts, uh, reference to um, our newspaper as well in the 18th century, particularly uh, reference to common pins. Those are straight pins. Those are the pins that you're going to use for um, keeping your clothes on, you know, putting your, um, your kids' clothes on, <clears throat> sewing with, that type of thing. Yes, I believe Elizabeth Kaufman asked um, if the, the, the rhyme at the beginning of the presentation, um, I'm sure you've probably also heard, find a penny, pick it up, all the day you'll have good luck. Yeah, it's just a more modern um, variant of a much older, um, a much older rhyme. Um, Any other sources rather than Chris Keppel's thesis that you'd recommend for pre-1700s pin making? Um, I don't have that many other re recommendations for pre-1700s pin making. I think that is one of those um, aspects and avenues for research that is open. Um, I don't think a lot of archaeologists that I have seen writing about pins until fairly recently make the assumption that pins, the presence of pins means that women were present, which isn't necessarily the case, obviously, um, as we've discovered today. Um, so um, taking a look at early pin making prior to the 1700s, I haven't seen anything other than that thesis. Um, so maybe there is, I don't, I don't have anything, sorry. I'm not a, a pin sense, uh, specialist by any stretch of the, 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 um, the, uh, the term. Um, I was just interested in, in learning about something that was a pretty um, mundane and, and typical, something that people would take, um, take for granted, maybe not even think about, but has a history. Um, I haven't done any research on safety pins other than the fact that I know they were invented in the mid 19th century. So they were around. Um, so um, in the mid 19th century and were, were being used then, they started out pretty large and, and clunky, clunky, but then, you know, quickly, became much more refined that, um, but they, they look pretty much the same as the safety pins that we have today. How sharp were the pins holding together garments? Um, I know from just reading um, about people taking pins out of um, documents that they could be quite sharp. Um, you can get, um, um, and also, I believe that um, in the, the books I've read about mudlarking, you have to be careful because if you're picking them up out of the, the, the sand, you can still get jabbed and you can still draw blood. So yes, they were quite sharp in order to stay sharp with centuries in the water and the sand. Um, I would say they started out to be quite sharp. 
Did the pin precede the needle or vice versa? Very interesting question. Um, they seem to um, develop alongside each other. Um, pins seem to be around first. Um, sewing as an ancient um, practice um, comes a little later than just holding something together um, mechanically. So, um, but that's way, way in, in our past history. So um, generally speaking, pins and needles uh, did develop pretty much alongside each other. Let's see, I'm just asking, I'm, I'm gonna, since we have quite a few, I'm, not, I'm gonna scan down um, and not um, comment on the comments and, and just, uh, to, just to address the questions. When did they introduce pin stops or balls that secure the bottom of the pin? Actually, I didn't know anything about pin stops. That's a new term for me. Um, I don't know. Um, it sounds to me like it's a later kind of thing. Um, I guess those are the kind of uh, what you see in like stick pins, the decorative uh, jewel jewelry, uh, I'm guessing. Um, I don't know. That's a good question. Um, Let's see. Uh, Cynthia Sweeney asked, the Mennonites use pin to fasten clothing. Yes, I believe they do. Some Mennonites do, some Amish do as well. Uh, they don't, um, they, they, they don't want to use a lot of mechanical fasteners in their clothing. So they use a lot of buttons. And, and I have seen um, Amish women um, fastening the bodices of their dresses with straight pins. That's true. Um, so, uh, someone mentioned pin money here, uh, that her grandmother wove rag rugs, uh, for pin money. And that's a really interesting concept that, um, has changed a lot over time. Um, in the, in the 16, 15, 1600s, pin money was actually money that was, um, due to uh, a woman as part of the, the household uh, finances. Um, it wasn't an allowance. It was something that was um, due as her right um, to purchase the things that were needed in her household. Um, and over time, that term started to become now, you know, from that to a, an allowance, then to uh, the money that was kept by a woman who only had an allowance from her husband and for the, the running of the house and she would hold off a little bit and to put away for um, necessities or things that she would like um, to purchase or uh, as a little savings account, account against, you know, bad days, um, bad times, um, perhaps, or um, an emergency of some sort. So it has changed over time. It has, it has gotten a, I wouldn't say necessary derogatory, but more of a, a um, kind of, it's been written off as something kind of quaint when in actuality it started out as something very different. Um, so, um, that whole concept of pin money is a very interesting one to investigate. Let's see. So yes, um, another question about pin money. The women did not sell pins. That was not the point of it. It was more about um, having money to buy pins. Um, and there was a period in time in the Middle Ages, I believe, when pins were being sold in shops on um, a certain days of the month. And so um, usually, I think it's the first few days of January or something like that I read in England, that you would go in and buy pins. And so you would need the money for that. 
So it wasn't about people, women selling pins to make money. It was more about having money to buy pins and other necessities. Uh, were pins uh, long ago as, as smooth as they are today? Yes, they did seem to be as smooth because they are all made from wire and wire um, tends to be smooth. And over in the process of making pins, they were also um, treated and uh, annealed and then um, sanded, if you will, with um, emery, um, which is a grit. It's um, some sandpaper is made from it. Um, but it's a, a grit that would smooth the pins because it was it was a concern. Um, Henry VIII um, had a proclamation in the 1600s um, talking about um, the issue of inadequate, or it was the late 1500s, 1600s, inadequate pin quality and having the pins not be um, sharp enough or um, smooth enough. So that it was a concern. Okay, let's see. There's a good question too. If I had any idea if, if handmade, if, if, if enslaved people were making pins similar to um, enslaved people making nails at Monticello. I don't have any references to enslaved people making pins. It's not to say that they couldn't have, uh, but I have not seen any references to that. Um, the a lot of the pin um, making starts in the um, in New England. It seems, um, of course, New England had slavery, um, but uh, it doesn't. It looks like the people, the early pin making, kind of strangely, was being done in almshouses, which meant that it was, you know, they were using a, a sort of a ready-made. Um, source of labor of uh, people who were poor and didn't have a home and were st staying in an almshouse. Um, those are mostly experimental, uh, but I have not found any evidence of pin um, manufacturing on uh, by enslaved people, but it'd be interesting to find some. A uh, question about whether straight pins were mostly used by the garment industry to make clothing rather than to hold clothing in place. Um, well, if you're referring to the historic making of clothing, actually fewer pins are, are used by um, skilled tailors and seamstresses than um, in you know, the 16th, 17th, 18th century than are being used to hold them together. Um, this in the manner of the way they were um, constructing clothing. Um, of, at, at that time, there were no such things as paper patterns like we use today. Um, clothing was drafted on to the person. So there would be pins to hold things in place um, as they were being fitted on the person. But um, those were, that is how pins were being used in the past. So, um, yeah, they wouldn't be uh, used as much necessarily as, as what were being used in households in the past. Yes, a heavily pleated ruffs on, on portraiture in Tudor England were held in place with pins as well. Um, and that can, and, and was likely why you see uh, Princess Joan having 12,000 pins. Um, these ruffles weren't a permanent thing. They were basically temporary so that they could be washed. Um, so um, I think I got through most of the questions. Um, please feel free to um, email um, the museum if you have any other questions. I will make a recommendation for reading if you would like. Uh, one thing that that address since many people here are interested in the, the sewing end of, of history. Um, I'm gonna hold this up so hopefully you can see it, um, but it's backwards, so I'll read it to you. Um, Mary Boudre, B-E-A-U-D-R-Y, uh, the book Findings, 
the material culture of needlework and sewing. So um, this is a, a great book um, for learning the history of things like thimbles and pins and needles and uh, scissors. Um, and um, it's written by an archeologist. So it is uh, published by, I believe it's still in print, uh, by Yale, Yale University Press. So that's, uh, I think I'm gonna call it quits for today. I thank you so much for um, attending my lecture. And um, I am very happy to have answered so many terrific questions. So I will hopefully see you at another one of our lectures. Um, and in closing, I will just say bye-bye.